Welcome everybody to our show. Again, this is the Eco Modernist Channel Live. I'm filling in for Carl Pauls, and we have with us today a very illustrious guest, a man named Simon Cho. Simon Cho is Associate Professor of Geometallurgy at the Geological Survey of Finland, specifically in the Circular Economy Solutions Unit. He has a BS in Physics and Geology, a PhD in Mining Engineering. And he has worked for 18 years in the Australian mining industry in research and development. He also has an extensive research background in industrial recycling, which I'd really love to get into with you. Welcome to the show, Simon. So welcome to our show. Let's start off by asking you, what is geometallurgy? So geometallurgy is a new field in the science of mining engineering, where it's a systems approach to integrate everything in geology with mineral processing and mining engineering. So everything that we can measure is actually measured and then information is exchanged between those three fields where we, at the design level, optimize our mining operation in a more sophisticated way. It's, it's essentially systems thinking for mining. I got that. Okay. Right. You kind of, you overlook everything. So it sounds like a a geometallurgy graduate would be the perfect head of a mining company. So we are forced in this discipline to talk to everyone and work with everyone. And so, yes, we're, we're, if you could couple that with a management qualification, we would be effective on the executive board because we have our fingers in, in everything. Because the mining industry operates just like many others, where everyone's got a contract. And that contract is for a specific bit. And we only do that particular job and we don't tend to talk to anyone else. And inefficiencies happen all over the place. Yeah, that's great. So let me let me get into the subject of this show. Uh, you've done a detailed study of what's required to phase out fossil fuels in favor of renewables. And your assessment is pretty bad. So could you give us the rundown on that? Yeah. So So what I'm trying to do here is a, a, a look at if we were to actually do what we said we're going to do and we're going to phase out fossil fuels and we're going to replace everything around us that is fossil fuels driven with a non-fossil fuel system what would that be what would that look like how many cars how many trucks how many solar panels how many wind turbines how many batteries and of what kind and the purpose of this study was to determine the volume of metal needed for the first generation of renewable units and then compare that against the mining industry's ability to deliver that. Recycling was also looked at, but this is a mining problem because most of the existing system hasn't been built yet. Like about 1% of the vehicle fleet is still is only EV and say renewable energy accounts for maybe 4% of the global a primary energy pie. So the non-fossil fuel system has yet to be constructed and as such a company recycled. And if it was all constructed tomorrow, it would not be available in large enough volumes to make a difference for like 20 years. So this is a mining problem. And so what this means is the environmental movement has got to partner up with the mining industry or the green transition is not going to happen. And so, um, yeah, and so, so the assessment is when you come out of this, Existing mining production cannot hold a candle against the volumes needed. As a, no way known can we deliver that much that quickly. And our ability to expand is also hampered because the, we don't have the reserves in the ground to, do, uh, to, to roll the plan out in its current form. The first problem we would meet is uh, the industrial capacity that is mostly in China at the moment, as large as it is, is still far too small to deliver the amount of units that we think we're going to need in the next couple of years, even if we had the raw materials to supply it, or the money. And, and so what this is suggesting is a couple of things. First of all, we need to really reassess how we're going to go about this. Fossil fuels are going, and these are the only technologies we've got to replace them with. So we are going to do it. It's just that my work is showing that the outcome is not going to work the way we think it is, or, or be as useful or as widespread as we think it is. So what's probably going to happen is it'll be much less in size and we're going to have to look at making things out of different minerals, like make batteries out of something else. 
yeah. zinc, fluoride, sodium. Uh, there, there's lots of options, but you've got to develop the value chain to do that. Uh, there are a few things in there that, that are not going to be replaced easily, like copper, and nickel won't be easily to replace either. And so we've also got to look at, um, can we change our society to scale back what we actually need if we were to be smart about it? And that's actually in the next generation of work. Yeah. Now, by the way, for our audience, what's the name of that study and where could they find it? Assessment of the extra capacity required of alternative energy electrical power systems to completely replace fossil fuels. Because I've got about so, seven or eight reports that are actually useful to your audience. I've uh, seen somebody else and uh, say this, and I'm kind of not quoting them directly, but they included a whole bunch of minerals. And they said, I believe that it was like exponentially more copper, more nickel, more That's chlorine. correct. By a figure of 10, another by a figure about five or six times. Yep, right. So, yeah, maybe you, could, so. maybe you could kind of talk about that a little bit. Okay, so there's, there's the big study referred to. Uh, this work has actually been published in full. The minerals required is coming. That, that's actually in the process of going through peer review at the moment. R right, so let me just get the numbers up. Um, so, copper is the one I'm most concerned about. Now, there are assumptions behind my study, and the, the point of debate at the moment is how big should the buffer storage be for stationary power storage for wind and solar? Now, current thinking thinks we need, say, five to seven hours. I'm saying 28 days, but even that is far, far, far undershooting what's actually needed. So these are numbers are conservative. Right. So sum everything together. Number of electric vehicles, number of hydrogen fuel cells, wind solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Sum it all together by metal. For the 28-day buffer assumption, in with everything else, we need 4.7 billion tons of copper. So say that again, 4.7 billion tons with copper. Now, the, the mining industry is producing 24 million a year. So that's in 2019 rates of mining production. So if we were to run the mining industry as it is now, which is having trouble you know, meeting demand, we would have to consume 195 years of production just to hit that target of 4.7 billion. Now, that's, remember, that is to replace the first generation stuff we've got around us now. Cars wear out turbines wear out after about 20 years you've got to take them all down and decommission them mm -hmm. and replace them which means we need to source another 4.7 billion tons again a you know 20 years later now from 2020 back to 4000 bc as in all historically uh in our in our history the human race mined 700 million tons of copper wow so to keep up with demand the way it is at the moment, we think we're going to do the same amount of volume in the next 22 years. So our existing reserves that are considered to be economic and technically accessible are about 880 million tonnes. It's about 30 years. We're not running out of copper. That's not the problem. You know, the whole Andes mountain range is one big giant copper deposit that's really low grade. Interesting. The problem is our ability to access that copper. Right. And, and so at the moment, we use the word economic viability. But you've also got the problem is, is the stuff is so fine, uh, small in size, but also so low grade that it's not really accessible in any sort of you know, practical quantities. So that's what we call reserves. So our reserves will last about 30 years. We are bringing on more deposits we are discovering, but they're getting less and less in size and capacity. Is that pipeline big enough for that? Probably not. But for the green revolution, we need 4.7 billion tons. That is 6.7 times the entire quantity, historical quantity the human race mined over the last 4,000 years. Our policymakers here in Europe thought that we were going to get this job done by 2030, no problems at all. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's a joke. It's, 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 it's what they call bullshit. <laughs> it's a bad uh, joke, man. So the, the problem is our policymakers are making decisions in a, in a way that's untethered to reality. We're not actually doing the math or the practicality of whether something can be done 
and everything is seen as an economic action, whereas if the demand is there, the outcome will magically um, physically appear. Yeah, ironically, uh, that's exactly what me and Chris were talking about uh, before you came on. You know, the disconnect that politicians have and the fact that they don't rely on experts rather than trying to figure it out for themselves. Yeah, you know? so, right, yeah. so that's copper. That's copper. So so let's go to lithium. Now, the future at the moment is, is seems to be found on lithium. Everyone wants lithium. Right. Uh, so th th this, this goes through a couple of these. Let's go through three, copper, lithium and nickel. So lithium is supposed to be the foundation chemistry for the next generation of batteries. So to sum it all together and what we need, we need 976 million tons of lithium. So global mining production was 95,000 tons. So if we were to hit that target with the mining industry the way it is at the moment, like, like without expansion at all, we would need to operate for 10,258 years to produce that volume of metal. We need 976 million tonnes of lithium. The reported global reserves are 22 million tonnes. Now, let's take it further. So what would happen if we were to say, expand our mines into reserves? The reserves in the ground that we know of, at the, this is in 2022, as stated by the US Geological Survey, account for 2.25% of the volume of metal we would need to replace the first generation of stuff that you have around you now. All battery metals, lithium, cobalt, graphite, and vanadium, are all under 5%. So it's not a question of going out and finding more metal. So that's the problem. Elon Musk came out and said, we don't need to use lithium to make batteries. And that is an amazing innovation. He's got some amazing people working for him. But to do it, he is making batteries out of a variation of NMC532, which is a chemistry that needs nickel, manganese, and cobalt. So let's look at nickel. Nickel and cobalt have problems. So nickel, we need 970.8 million tons of nickel, first generation stuff. Mining production of nickel was 2.3 million tons in the year 2019. So we would have to work for 413 years of the mining industry capacity as it is now to hit that target. And nickel reserves is less than 10% of what we need if we were to access it. These, the, the problem is these numbers are so large, we're not going to be able to do it in time. We don't yeah. have the capacity. It's 20 years for EVs. I don't yeah. know. What do you think of that? It, it comes down to the life of the battery. If they can make the battery last longer, which they claim they're going to be able to, so let's, let's wind it out to say 20 years. And even if you made it 50 years, like, like a battery lasts for 50 years. Well, no, I'm, I'm talking yeah. about like in terms of uh, EVs becoming, replacing the internal combustion engine. That's what they okay, say. Okay, for, for, for us to do that, so the, the fleet of vehicles, I had a very crude estimate, and I came up with 1.4 billion vehicles. The real number is probably closer to 1.5. Um, and they think that by the time we get to 2050, the industrial system will be four times larger than it is now. So, so th these numbers are way, way conservative compared to what they think is going to happen. We're going to bring on 70 million new vehicles a year, each year for the next 20 years, and then we can replace it in 20 years. What I've done is, okay, we've got an estimate of them, the light-duty vehicles, heavy-duty vehicles in 2040, so sometime in the future. What is the market share of the different chemistries? Yeah. So then we yeah. can get the, the cuts of what the different chemistries are. There's patient stationary storage, but we've also got the content of each chemistry. Right. And so we can now compress it down to how much metal we need by each chemistry, by each metal, sum it together into one column. So here's what was included. So each column is metal quantity required for onshore wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, solar panels, metal content in the construction of nuclear power plants, metal content in hydro power plants, 
metal content in new geothermal power plants, construction of 1.4 billion electric vehicles, less their batteries, the platinum content in hydrogen fuel cells, neodymium in there, there's iridium, there's, there's all sorts of bottlenecks in there, I just didn't have the data at the time. Metal content in the electric vehicle batteries across all the different chemistries summed together, and the metal content for the 28-day storage buffer, and I did a 48-hour plus 10% buff because I found two references to, to market as so. So everything is then compressed into these two columns. Mm -hmm. 28 days and 48 hours of buffs, the assumption. But the 28 days, this is actually what we need to, to look at, because even that is too conservative. So this is how we get the numbers for aluminium all the way down to rare earths. And so here is the actual metal produced in 2019. That's that column there. Go down to rare earths down the bottom. So neodymium, which is what we need to make in magnets, we need 40 years of production for that. Solid state batteries, for example, require lots of germanium in it. Now, we want 4.1 million tons, but we're producing 143 tons a year at the moment. So that's 29,000 years of production. So the guys who come up with this stuff, great. It's great science and everything like that. But when you want us to scale it up, that's when the trouble starts. So here's reserves. Metal required. Reported reserves and the percent. How much do our existing reserves are in the ground? So the sequence goes like this: mining production at the moment is not strong enough for those which is open wall mines. For every thousand deposits we discover, only one or two become mines. And just because you've discovered a mineralized patch doesn't mean you can actually mine it. And it takes like fifteen to twenty years to develop a mine. So here are the numbers shown graphically. The red is the twenty-eight days. That's a log scale. Million tons, 10,000 down to 0 0.01. The blue is 48 hours plus 10%. That's way too small. The yellow is reported reserves, and then the black is production as it is now. Now, a resource versus a reserve. A reserve is something where you've got some sort of engineering feasibility study to look at it and say it is worthwhile doing. Our current production of rare earths just, is, just a, isn't even close. All right, this is the one I wanted to show you. In the red on the left, is the amount of metal we need to produce one generation of stuff around us. Yellow is reserves, green is estimated resources on land, and the purple is the resource we know of on the sea floor. Now, mining the sea floor is a dumb idea. I don't think we're going to be able to do it without any environmental capacity and damage. But this is to show that there's not enough metal down there anyway, not that we know of. So. The all the metal in the system we know as planet Earth is on the right, and the metal we need to replace one generation of stuff around us now is on the left. And this is to show that this is just not going to work. It's just not. It hasn't been part of our lexicon to ask this basic question. We've been very ideological for the last 50 years, where we do our problem solving based on an ideology belief, not based on the facts at hand. So this is the Net Zero America project from Princeton University, and they came up with a, an estimate of five to seven hours. And the way they've done it is this black line is actually what's called demand load. Supply and demand must balance to a millionth of a second, which, you know, the power must be clean and sinusoidal. It must be at 50 hertz, same voltage, same current, and it can't move around from that. And how much electrical power we need has got to balance with supply. Now, sometimes the supply exceeds the demand. That's so what they do is they, they catch that and they store it. And then sometimes you're in these peaks where supply is a little bit under demand, and so that's when they release the supply. And so in this sort of model, they only have to keep it for a couple of days. And in, this is the difference in supply and demand. And if that's all we had to deal with, then you know, five to seven hours is probably okay. But this is solar, right? Solar and wind, but solar in particular. The sun in winter is not as strong as the sun in summer. Right now, the, the, these systems are so large now, they can't be balanced off something else. At the moment, we're balancing by, by trading power between grids, mostly fossil fuels. So this is a solar radiance for Germany in the year 20, uh, 2015. So solar radiance doesn't mean power production, but it, it's the source of it. Like you need... This is the amount of solar radiance you've got available. So you would actually pick the halfway mark. This is our base load. Anything over that dotted line will be excess and needs to be stored. So this is across our summer. 
And anything under that dotted line is actually where we need excess released. So that's our buffer, the gray. So the power buffer would need to collect excess power over six months, store it for about six to seven months and release it slowly over the six months after that. So that is 28 days, that red square, and that's one reference, that's 48 hours. Imagine if you will, five to seven hours. This what I'm saying, this is the problem. You've got a related problem with wind. It's a very crude calculation. It does include everything, and the numbers are actually far too low. They just highlight certain blind spots that we need to go and look at more carefully. I've heard that uh, we're running out of building sand. Uh, is that going to be a problem as well? Yep. Oh, we, we've got problems on all sectors. Between the year 2000 and 2018, every single consumption sector has expanded by a lot, not by one or two percent. We're not even remotely stable. We are expanding at a phenomenal rate. So this is the fossil fuel system expanding. And it's such a monster that, that, that when we replace it, it's going to have to be many times that to replace it because everything has to be retooled. These are American numbers. This is what the average person will consume over their lifetime. So you mentioned cement. We need cement, 23.4 tonnes. And the stone, sand, and gravel, 581 tons. Now, we've actually sort of already dredged a lot of the rivers to the, to the depth that they are and accessing enough sources for these metals. It's, it's not just metals. It, it's things like clay. It's things like sand and cement. And every resource you can think of, arable land, food production, Society at the moment is running in a way that's very inefficient and is consuming resources far in excess of our carrying capacity. And what you've just touched on there is one, but only one of the problems we are facing. If we're passing the carrying capacity, how could we be able to pass it? And yet at the same time, things are not crashing already. So but they are crashing. We've got this basic idea of, of the carrying capacity on the, the ones in, that worry me the, the most uh, the phosphorus cycle and the nitrogen cycle, which is actually related to our industrial agriculture practice, loss of biodiversity, which is also, as it turns out, related to agriculture. And here's what means with that. So our world and data, great site. 10,000 years ago, we had 57% forests and about 42% wildland glass and shrubs uh, on the land surface that's actually sort of able to be measured like this. And you can see this pink wedge that's come in that little purple stripe in 2018 is 1% of urban built up land. So it's our cities and our industry. The rest of it is crops and grazing land. So the trouble is, okay, our industrial sector is putting out a lot of pollution, but we also need to have a very serious look about how we're growing our food. So the mass of all humans and the domestic animals uh, make up 96% of mammals on, on the earth. It's not all life, it's actually just mammals. But you've got all these dead zones in the sea uh, that are caused by plastic pollution, but also your uh, fertilizer runoff from industrial fertilizers. And so these hypoxic areas, and these dead zones are generally caused by significant nutrient pollution, phosphorus and nitrogen in particular, from intensive agricultural practices. Now, you talk to the agricultural guys and they take offense to that. And they say the problem is not the agriculture, it's how it's being used. But you get the same outcome. And a lot of it is actually along the coastlines. And so we're, the oceans are actually acidifying. So you've got, you've got all this stuff here. The base of the food chain on land in the ocean is now collapsing. Right, you know, insect populations, small birds, plankton in the sea, the ecological implications are not good for the long-term sustainability of large mammals like us. And so then you've got the plastics. So every year we're dumping 12.7 metric tons of plastic into the oceans. And it's the equivalent of five grocery bags filled with plastic for every 30 centimeters or one foot of coastline in the, on, in the world. In 2025, the annual input is estimated to be about twice that again, or 10 bags for every foot. So, and by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the oceans uh, than they'll, they'll outweigh the fish. Wow. Um, guys, guys, seriously? 
<laughs> you, know, you know something though a lot of that is is because the way things work is that the externalities are not factored into uh the value of things yeah we could we could do a lot better and a lot of it comes down to how we see things yeah so, so okay so here's what's happened in the last couple of decades population sizes of mammals birds fish and amphibians and reptiles have seen an average drop of 68 percent since 1970 only 2% of the large fish remain on the planet in the mid 2000s compared to the 1960s. Pesticides effects on insect populations are enormous, Roundup in particular. 40% of all insect species are declining globally. Declining bee populations pose a threat to global food security. Beekeepers in the United States reported losing 45.5% of their managed honeybee colonies from April 2020 to April 2021. Biological indicators for vertebrates to imply population annihilation and the six maths extinction. 70% of bird mass as domestic, is domestic birds, and 30% is the other 11,000 species. Consider, if you will, how it will look in 50 years. Yeah. So anyway, you get the idea. So what's what's happening here is all the things that we don't care to measure are accelerating. We are harvesting all the systems beyond their ability to repair themselves, right? And so uh, in, instead of the natural replenishment that, that could be done, if we harvested like a much, much less volume, the planet could be sustainable. But because we're chewing through those systems so quickly, we're chewing through the legacy stuff that's needed to produce the next generation. And that's the problem. So when it stops, it stops quickly. I'm not quite getting you. What do you mean by the legacy? Um... Okay, so so for uh, you need a large natural system where some of it dies off through natural internal consumption, like plants and animals eating other plants and animals, right? And there's a natural birth rate. Uh, new species will be born and they'll propagate. We need enough new species to propagate and be born to be about the same or more than the species being consumed or dying, mm -hmm. right? And that's the, the ability for the system to maintain our stability in size and complexity. I see. If for some reason, the number of those species is being eaten or, or dies off faster than they can be replenished, the system is starting to become simpler and will contract in size and its ability it to maintain its own stability crashes. Right. And that's what's happening to us. Gotcha. Yeah, I think uh, plankton is a good example of that. Over the past uh, five or six decades, it's dropped like 40%. And plankton is the bottom of the food chain. If the bottom of the food chain disappears, then, uh, then we're having difficulties. Yeah, so this is, a, this is how I describe to other hairy knuckle mining engineers how I see the world. And the world is a system. And... I'm from the mining industry, but I'm also an environmentalist as well. I'm actually sitting outside of the normal echo chambers of how we should talk about things. And so I see the world as a series of interlocking systems. Most of the time we're talking about carbon pollution. That's the atmosphere. But what I've just showed you just now is a species dive in the biosphere. Then you've got the hydrosphere, which is the salt water in the oceans, and you've got the freshwater on land, which we also depend on. But underneath all that is the geosphere. Now, that geology, the rocks and systems that everything rests upon, is a dynamic system that changes everything else, and everything influences everything else. And the whole planet sits inside a magnetic field which interacts with the sun. And th those interactions tend to correlate with our big volcanic events. So it's a dynamic, self-regulating system embedded in a larger system and stabilized by life systems on a planetary scale. And that's when you actually look from a geological point of view, change is the one constant, it's always changing, but it's the life on earth that's actually regulating stuff. And so the whole system change is mitigated by biodiversity and life systems. Because every time the environment changes, something in the genetic library of the systems that are there are the solution. And then a new dominant species takes over. But you can't do that if, if there's nothing there to start with and everything's dead. And so this is the conundrum we face. Right. A quick question. The, uh, is uh, dirt and clay the biosphere or the geosphere? 
both. It's the interface nope. between the two. Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, in fact, like uh, soil, for example, has a, a large organic content. Mm -hmm. And, and the, what we call the soil food web it allows things to grow. Right. And But life happens to be in all sorts of places. It's amazingly tenacious. Well, getting back to the issue with the green transition. Now, I'm, I'm looking at that chart and I see the least use of minerals is nuclear and hydro. So if the politicians by some chance were to say, hey, we're not going to go wind and solar as, as a main thrust of things, we're going to, our backbone of is going to be nuclear and hydro. And then the EVs, they will evolve away from lithium. Uh, they already have the graphene battery. They have other things. So assuming that they evolved away from it, uh, lithium as well, which I think is a given, tell me if I'm wrong, it would, could we see a better ending or a good ending or something? Does this have to be tragic? Okay, the simple answer is we're not going to be able to generate enough power fast enough to replace fossil fuels. It's up here. Okay. Yeah, it's slow. That's true. Yeah. And so so the black line, um, if you can see that, hang on, there we go. The black line at the top is the amount of electrical power we will need to supply to society on an annual basis to replace fossil fuels. Blue columns are the expansion of power delivered by the nuclear industry if they would expand by 25 new reactors each and every year from 2025 onwards. And we get out to the year 2020, 2101, 75 years later, and existing resources and reserves all the way out to unconventional are consumed. And we're only 60% of the way there. So the existing nuclear power plant fleet cannot help us. The problem with hydro, hydroelectricity is our best performer uh, all around, but you need a geographic situation where hydro can happen. Exactly. And any site that's actually useful for hydro happens to have a hydro plant on it already. There are more sites we can use, but is there enough sites to actually put on the number of units that we think we're going to do? And the answer is no. That's, that's when the trouble starts. There's a long winded answer to the question where it does have a good outcome if we choose. Now, all existing systems that we've got on the table, each and every one of them has a bottleneck or in scale up. Each of them work at the moment in a small scale, and it's not a technology problem. It, it, the trouble comes is when we want to scale it up for 8 billion people. So what has to happen now is we've got to, first of all, radically change our society, but then we've also got to reimagine what we use energy for. And the solution for the next generation of in industry, like the next industrial era, will have to have a foundation different to what we're seeing now. Now, there are two vectors that we could develop if we choose to. One would is if we evolve the thorium nuclear cycle. The existing cycle is too complex in, to, to, to use, but if we were to evolve it to one of the subcategories called thorium molten salt, yes, we might yes. get somewhere. But it, it, it takes time to develop this stuff and then to scale it up and make it accessible. So it's not going to arrive fast enough to actually avoid a crash. I the second thing to look at is um, I was looking at, uh, for example, in my tour of duty through all the energy systems, I came across the work of like you know, Nikola Tesla. What was he working on? And if it worked, how would we use it? So I wrapped my head around that. I'm actually writing a book on that, which we uh, want to get around to it. But there were a whole lot of ideas. Like, uh, you know, the, there was the zero point energy idea, which they've proven it exists. Zero point energy is the idea at the atomic level at a very, very small level, we're sitting in a sea of energy of amazing abundance. But to harvest it, you need to make a device that's really small. And the smaller you make it, the more effective it is. And when they proved it in the 80s, I think it was, machine technology could only take you so small. But now we've got nanotechnology and 3D printing. And so that might change the rules. The other uh, system I liked looking at was the electric universe theory by you know, Wallace Thornhill. And he came up with some ideas in there that go down the rabbit hole, what do they mean? And that they all imply our understanding of magnetism, gravity, and um, electrostatics are interacting in a way that we have only partially understood. But th and so there, there might be something in that direction that's useful. But these things are theoretical. So even if someone did work them out, 
it would take like 10, 20 years before something industrially useful could actually come out of them, right? So what has to happen now is society has to make do with what we have now. Now, you could argue for the last two centuries in particular, we have been very, very lucky, but also very immature in how we actually conduct ourselves. Our stewardship of the planet has been quite poor. And so as a society, we are now required to grow up. But we were never going to face certain things within ourselves until we had to. So while we're about to go through a very difficult time, you could argue that that time is the best chance for humanity to grow up and socially become a genuinely mature, sustainable society on the other side. And so this is not necessarily something to be afraid of, even though it's going to hurt. Now, recycling. I'm part of the recycling world. I was looking at sorting. I was looking at a device called electromagnetic fragmentation, where we use electricity to break things apart. There is a lot of useful technology in recycling, but the real problem we have is getting enough material up to the recycling plant so it's not the right kind. The, the challenge they've got in the current recycling industry is how do they collect enough of the garbage and then get it to the right residue to the right process plant? Because each process plant will be optimized to a particular waste stream. And the problem is getting a consistent volume to it that, that actually makes it viable. And that is the problem. So the evolution for recycling is not developing more technology and how to recycle, it's how we use recycling technology. It's, it's collection, um, but we've also got to design things to be recycled, but at the moment we don't. Even though this is common sense, we don't. Right, right. So there's evolutions in and around recycling to make it work that actually have nothing to do with recycling itself. But if we did do that, we could get more metal from it. But now you've got the discussion of how much energy is put in. Like at what point is it not worth recycling something? And so your, your smartphone, for example, is full of exotic metals. Very, very exotic metals of all kinds. And they're, they're so miniaturized and they're so integrated. It's, it's such a pain in the ass that there's, you're not going to be able to recycle all of them. You might be able to get some of them. And so they're designed to be used and thrown away. You put the whole phone into the furnace and you kiss goodbye all those um, ele uh, uh, exotic elements. What we should do is make a phone that's much simpler, using yes. alloys that are much simpler. We scale back our requirements and we design it to be taken apart and recycled. Well, how about reliability need, too? Yeah. So all you need, all you need is to have a phone, make a phone call to someone and send an SMS. All the rest of that crap on the iPhone is not needed. Yeah. We don't need a screen with gallium in it. We really don't. So one of the things I, we, what we call, this is actually how I talk to the, my, the students is, okay, once we've gone through all the problems, we've got to put all that stuff aside and seriously think about what do we actually do. And we, we've got to actually face the future with open hearts and open minds, or we just roll over and get overwhelmed by these problems. And one of them is we reimagine every single sector and how I see recycling being reimagined. If the problem is getting hold of stuff that's been manufactured, but we are surrounded by an abundance of stuff that, that's now sort of at the end of its life but still has useful things in it, I can see a situation where we reestablish the old boneyards, where we're collecting things. Imagine all those ICE cars, internal combustion cars. They're full of things like bearings and um, axles and, and alternators and batteries and radiators. and Right, I can see a situation where each of those cars are rounded up and they're pulled apart, and all the valuable bits are actually kept in a shed. This is like a, a conventional auto wreckers. This is what we do now. But it's not just for cars, it's for everything. Electronics, for example, I think there's going to be a real problem getting hold of electronics and semiconductors because it's, we're all dependent on Taiwan and China to make the stuff. And the supply chains across the world for that stuff is about to become non-linear, I believe. Troublesome. Can we have a situation where we pull apart those electronics and re reuse some of them? So we've got the idea is we're pulling apart stuff into useful stuff, feeding all that material, that, say, into a machine shop, you know, where you can, you can actually sort of, you know, with, with lathes and drill presses and 
welders and we're going to make stuff. Like we could probably wind an electric motor, but we're not going to make a semiconductor ourselves. But if we can repurpose all this stuff into new things that we need. So I'm mm. not saying we're making new cars. We're making a whole series of devices to innovate to application on the fly. So this is going to be a whole field of recycling that's going to start up. And then the bits that are left over, right, that we can't really do anything with, that's what goes into recycling. Our hydrometallurgy, our pyrometallurgy, sorting, shredding, all of that stuff. And, but I think it's all going to be optimized on one site. So, so all the collection comes in one end. And we'll have multiple groups looking at stuff. And at the other end, we have useful things coming out of a machine shop. And we have some useful metals and rubbers and ceramics and glass will be coming out of the recycling wing. It's going to be something like that. And your projections for minerals needed, uh, do you think our third world countries will be mostly caught up so that by the 2060s, 2070s, our need for mining will start level off and start to go down with the population? That's a, a reasonably complex question. My, my work was to map how the system was in 2018. By 2062, we're going to go from 7 billion out to something like 10.4 billion. The problem is to replace what we have around us now that's dependent on fossil fuels, we don't have enough minerals in the ground as it is now. If we were to expand to the point where everyone on the planet had the same level of development, like all the poorer nations came into alignment with, say, Europe, Germany in Europe, that would be more again. And, and oil in particular, we don't have enough oil for that. Now, in, in terms of the population debate, there's actually two series of problems that run in parallel. Elon Musk very famously said that uh, we are facing a situation where our population replacement rate is crashing and you know, um, fertility problems are decreasing. That is actually correct. But uh, a problem correctly stated is half solved. What is being in, in parallel to that, there's another set of issues that Musk has not come up against. What is being harvested from the planetary environment far exceeds what that environment can sustainably recharge and replace. And so we are over our skis. Food production in particular is a problem, how we do our food production. And so while the existing population is having trouble replacing itself in some sectors of the planet, it's growing in others, our resource consumption is about to spike, not just go up, it's about to go up a lot, was we want to replace the most dense energy system the world has ever known. And we're going to replace it with a very expensive and less effective energy system. The honest, brutal truth is that's a crap plan and it's not going to work and we need to think of a better one. Yeah. Uh, Earl is uh, welcome here. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, we had a few weeks back, and it's a good show if you want to check it out, a show called Empty Planet. And it, have you ever heard of the book, The Empty Planet? Uh, I have heard of it, but I haven't read it. Yeah, well, we had the uh, author on, and he's a statistician. And what he says, and he made a very good case, he said it's not 11, even though 11 is the United Nations estimates, he claims that the as part of the thesis of his book is that the figures are very far off, and it's actually it should be around 9 billion that we will fall to in the same mm -hmm. time frame. You know, it's just worth mentioning. Yeah. Okay. What do you see about it? I mean, this is maybe going 20 years into the future. I think it was uh, Bloomberg said that, I think either 10 or 20 years, I forget, they were saying that mining from space will be a multi-billion dollar industry. We could probably do it on a small scale. Can we do it in large enough volumes to be useful the way we have it at the moment? You also got to think, what do you mean by that? Like, are you going to go into space, go to the asteroid belt, mine it out there and bring the metal back? Or I've, I actually heard someone suggest this in a mining think tank. Well, we go out to the asteroid belt, we do a bit of exploring, we find a good asteroid, which in itself is a problematic thing. Lasso it, tow it back to Earth, and from a low orbit, we drop it into the Australian desert, and after it lands, we mine it out. And then when that runs out, we go out and get another asteroid and drop it next to the first one. And it says, you Muppets, what could possibly go wrong? Also, in, in terms of the amount of metal that you require to make a difference, I mean, you look at the volumes of, of metals we're mining at the moment. If, if that comes in asteroids dropping onto the planet, 
one day it's going to end badly. So the idea of going up into space and mining, I think, is feasible in a very, very small application at the moment, but to develop our technology at the moment to the point where we can scale it up, that requires an industry base that I think back on Earth that I think is going to struggle because it's a volume thing. You might be able to produce a small amount of volumes, but how do you get it back onto the planet to be useful for everyone else? You never have a black and white, yes, it'll work or no, it won't. You generally have a list of pros and cons in any given environment or situation will be a showstopper or it might let it through. So it's complicated. Concerning the EVs, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but it's not that it can't be done. It's if you apply the kind of techniques and recycling that you want done that you can have EVs replace the internal combustion engine. So the, we've got the, to make the first generation, we need more metal than mining can supply at the moment. But we will build some of them, right? When it comes time to repurpose and recycle, if we can actually get the EVs up to the recycling plants, which in its own right will cost a lot of energy, finding busted EVs and transporting them to distance, that's a problem in its own right. But let's say we can do that. There is technology to recycle reasonably well some of those materials, but will we be able to recycle enough metal to actually then reconstitute new EVs in large enough numbers to be useful? And at the moment, the answer to that is no, but it might improve later. A lot of this is contingent of someone coming up with an idea later. Julian Simon and uh, Paul Enrich. They, yeah, you hear Paul Ehrlich, yeah. Bet. Did you hear about the bet? That's yeah. Hard? And Simon won the bet. And to, to, for our audience, is what happened was is that Ehrlich was just said everything's going into crap because you know we're just going to run out of everything. And and Simon said no, you're going to be able to innovate our way out of it. And Simon was right. So yes and no. So, yeah, so I, 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 I'm so paraphrasing I, it, but. How does that look? How does that kind of a, of a thing look in terms of our whole conversation? Right. So, I met Paul a couple of times at a, a conference. He's a good guy. I think he came up with a perfectly valid hypothesis, but he was overridden by a technological innovation that actually was misunderstood. So he had the idea of the population bomb that we we're going to hit these growths and we couldn't produce enough food. But the green revolution started up where they were using petrochemicals in fertilizers to get more and more food out of the same parcel of land. But what's been happening is our available arable land has been degrading. And this is actually where a lot of the problems with the phosphorus and the nitrogen overloading has happened. And the population will get to the point where it's very large, very large population, but a small arable land to grow the food. And the methods to grow the food happen to be wreaking havoc in other parts of the system. Right, so back to the bet. So I, I believe there'll come a point when Paul will be proven to be right. But because of the Green Revolution, he misjudged when he would be right. He was probably 50, 60 years too early. That doesn't mean he's wrong. So back to the bet. So Simons did indeed win the bet. But if they had the same bet 10 years later, Ehrlich would have won the bet. This is a contingent on economic growth and what we're actually producing. We're now in a rate of diminishing returns of what we have to put in to our industrial and economic system compared to what we're getting out. And this is happening on multiple fronts. So if they were to have the same bet now, in fact, for members of the audience, this is a good thing to look at. Go into the actual words of the bet. What were they measuring? and measure it for each decade from that point on to now. And you'll probably find the decade they had the bet in was the only time Simons could have won, and every time since then, he would have lost. What will help put us on the best path forward, do you think? Right. Uh, so I haven't given some thoughts to this. Our biggest problem at the moment is how we see things. We are both the solution but also the problem. We're not using reality as a problem-solving tool. We're using ideology. 
So we've got to see things as they are. There's going to be a change in relationship between society, minerals, economics, technology. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it's actually one relationship. They're all different aspects of the same thing. As the existing system starts to unravel, people will get stressed. Now, they actually think in terms of the only reality they know and the only reality is possible is the system that they are losing. Therefore, despair. What I would tell them is the system we were born and bred to serve is done, but we are not. So the young people will now have to understand what they're seeing as it truly is, and then understand that they themselves can make a new system if they see things differently and they scale back their expectations and go in a completely different direction. And that direction is what would happen is what we want, what we need, and what we do become the same thing. And as to tell these kids what to do, the ability to learn and adapt in the face of instability is the most useful thing to do. After that, it's technical problem solvers that will be very useful, but it's also the people who can build culture. And at the moment, our culture has, is tearing itself apart in all the places we need to be strong. So that needs to be brought back. So every single sector now needs to be rebuilt from the ground up, including our culture. We've got to get to the point where we can actually sort of trust each other at the moment, where instead we have been convinced to destroy each other and everything around us. Yeah, that's true worldwide. That's true between countries too. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Is there anything you would like to say before we end the show? Yes. Different tribes who normally hate each other's guts are all using my work to flame each other. The old idea of left wing, left wing, right wing politics. Once we actually start confronting these systems, those paradigms will struggle to survive because we'll have other things to worry about. And you know, left wing, right wing, they're the part of the same bird and that bird's about to be served up as Peking duck. If all we have is a hammer, everything's gonna look like a nail. And that is the same for every single tribe. All tribes have to understand that the hammer and the nail are now not worthwhile. And they now need to sit around the table with people they used to previously argue with and understand that everyone's got to let go of their ideology and look at things from a completely new perspective. All problems have to be put on the table at the same time, along with all solutions. And everyone around the table has got to have an adult conversation where we all cut the crap. That's not possible in the current environment. Yeah. That's very, that's very true. And uh, this is a marvelous, marvelous discussion. I'm so glad we had you on. I really appreciate your spending the time with us. Hang on. This is, this is actually when I like to sh uh, finish all presentations. Go right ahead. Uh, with, with, could we please have a sensible conversation? This is how I, I use this in most presentations professionally, and I'm finding the audience often claps. And so we're ready to hear that. What do we do? We've got to decide what kind of world we want to live in and who are we? And that, do, like, do we live in fear? Do we respond in fear? Do we turn around each other or do we do something else? And then for the first time, we can actually sort of develop a new paradigm. So all human systems are showing signatures of stress in some form, all natural systems from a steep decline and the relationship between society, natural resources, technology, et cetera, needs to evolve to something else. Society and its economic systems approaching an era of disruptive change as structural imbalance is resolved and the system seeks a new equilibrium. The whole system needs to be reinvented in all sectors to a new set of fundamental limitations. A new policy or a different political party is simply not going to be enough. And you're either part of the solution or you're part of the precipitate. And so first understand, develop a different paradigm and then we get to work. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. That's, that's yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's a chemistry joke, by the way. Yeah. If you're either part of the solution, you're oh. part of the precipitate. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not being a chemist, that, is, that, that went right over my head. <laughs> anyway. Well, well, anyhow, thanks so much. I want to tell everybody that we're here every Sunday to see us live. Go to Seattle TV. That's Soy. Adel, as in like Seattle, but with the soy in the front. 
And you could also see us on the Eco Modernist uh, channel. And please like and subscribe to the Eco Modernist channel and help our cause. We want to thank everybody and stay well. Yeah, and uh, as Paul usually said, uh, emissions first. Peace, Peace and justice. justice will follow. Yes. <laughs>